Nicodemus's whole orientation was physical. In his response, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God. Again, he's addressing the spiritual for the second time. Unless they're born of water, that's the body, and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, that's your mother. But the spirit gives birth to spirit, that's salvation. You should not be surprised at my saying, Nicodemus, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. Look at how he's drawing a correlation now to nature and things that can be understood to explain the spiritual. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, I'm trying to get you to experience something that you don't understand. Let's look at this. It's like being born, but it's not really being born. It's like the wind blowing, but it's not really the wind in the trees, is it? There's another dynamic. It's this dynamic. He's trying to tell Nicodemus that he has a spirit that needs to come alive. How many times have you thought about training to do that as a doctor? Let's talk about it. As doctors, we're going to have great privileges to engage patients at several levels. And I think chronic disease is one of those delightful ways to do it. Patients with chronic problems will drive you crazy. They will be at your door constantly. They will have lists of questions. They will take an hour in the examination room. I didn't make a whole lot of money in America because I spent too long in my examining rooms talking to patients. <laughs> and I loved every minute of it. That's what I liked about practicing medicine. It wasn't just the fact that I was able to make money. It was because I had a chance to touch lives. Okay, let's look. We first must do no harm. That's the Hippocratic Oath. We must always be professional. And if you're a Christian and you're not doing your best in your studies, you might as well leave medical school because we don't need believers who call themselves and push the idea that they're Christian and then do lousy medical work. That's an oxymoron in my mind. So please, Shape up if you're not there. You don't have to make all A's. It's your desire. It's your drivenness. It's your purpose. That's what I'm questioning. Are you going to be professional? Are you going to know what you know and what you don't know and when to call your colleagues? Are you just going to fake it and make up something and hurt the patient? That's an issue of the soul and the heart. And you're going to have to make those choices every day in your doctor's practice. Usually we diagnose and treat problems. Usually we answer questions. Sometimes we counsel and give advice. Maybe because we need to or because patients ask us. Sometimes, and this gets a little more uncomfortable, we must confront and challenge patients. Mrs. Mrs. Smith, why is it so hard to take your medicine? Your heart failure is getting worse. Your kidneys are failing more. You really need that ACE inhibitor. You need to use your Lasix every day and you need to restrict the amount of fluid. Can you help me understand what's keeping you from doing what I'm asking you to do as your doctor? You don't come at Mrs. Smith and say, what are you, fool? What's wrong with you? Come on, let's get with the program here. You need to take your medicine. If you don't take your medicine, I'm not going to treat you. Get out of my office. Now, I know doctors who act like that. I don't think a whole lot of them. My encouragement is don't be like that. So sometimes we must confront and challenge. I would say do it in love and gentleness. Do it firmly when you need to. Sometimes we must say, I do not know. Could everybody say that out loud with me? I'd like you to practice it a lot. I do not know. No. Mrs. Smith, we've worked on this problem for three months now. You've seen me six times. And I've got to tell you that I don't know what's wrong with you still. I've tried my best. And today I want to introduce you to a colleague that I think can take this farther than I can. I'd like to call him up right now and make an appointment for you. Mrs. Jones, I don't know why that car ran over your daughter. 
I'm so sorry, but I'm here to help you put life back together. I know some people that can help you get through this. I'd like to introduce you to them, but I just don't know why this happened. I'm sorry. That's a real good thing to practice. Say it often and say it loudly. I don't know. I just don't know. That keeps you humble, and that's a good trait for doctors. And then, rarely, we get the privilege of talking about spiritual things in the medical encounter. Oh, we can force this. We can force people to talk about, I mean, you could every patient, you could evangelize. But no, you're not a pastor. You're a doctor. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not about to encourage you to force spiritual conversations. But folks, they will arise. And when they do, don't run from them. Be prepared. Be excited about that. No one on this earth has a better opportunity to evangelize than a doctor. And it is done by example, not by words. It is done by time invested in relationship building. It is not done by preaching at your patients. So please don't do that. But don't run from those opportunities when they are searching. You know, it's very easy to say, I know this is really hard for you. It would mean a lot to me if I could pray for you, how would you feel if we just prayed for a minute? Now that's not threatening. They can be Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, atheist, and they can still respond to that question with a polite yes or no, I'm not comfortable. Almost every patient that I ever asked that said, oh yes, doctor, please pray for me, no matter what their orientation of faith was. I was very surprised. I expected some turnoffs. I didn't get any really through the years of my practice. I practiced about 13 years. You know, you know a lot, but you don't know it all. You're going to know a lot more when you get finished with this crazy process called medical training, but you're never going to know it all. So I want you to be humble. I want you to be approachable because Jesus certainly was, even at night, even by scholars. Let them ask for help without punishing them for taking your time or asking you things that you don't know and embarrassing you because you have to say you don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of ways that we punish our patients. Don't do that. Just let them ask. Build trust. And that is built on integrity and honesty and open dialogue. No one wants to see a doctor they can't trust. And unfortunately, what I see in Ukraine is patients shopping five, six, eight, ten doctors to synthesize their own diagnosis out of all that because they don't trust any of them that they saw. My encouragement is be somebody they can trust and inspire confidence. Look people in the eye. Dress for success. Look like you mean that you want to be good. Know what you're doing. Study well and seek excellence in your work. Okay, everybody stand up. Let's stand up. Take a big breath, stretch your hands over your head, look forward to supper here in a few minutes. Meet her there and check your blood sugar around lunchtime. I'm proud of you that you do that. I know that's a lot of trouble for you. I really want to tell you I appreciate these numbers that you brought to me. It's going to help me treat you better. Um, you know, Judy, you're 18 years old and no girl your age should have to take five medications. And I'm really sorry, but you know what? I'm proud of you that you are keeping up with all these medicines. Even if you miss one occasionally, that's no big deal. I'm, I just want you to know I'm proud of you. What you're doing is hard to do, and I think you're doing a good job. Those don't take but about 10 seconds, but it means the world to your patients. You make a friend for life. Can you imagine being talked to that way by a doctor? Has that ever happened to you? Would you show me your hands? Has that sort of conversation ever happened in your life in a doctor's office? Make it your point to do that at least once a day with somebody. Allow your patients to trust you. You don't need to become their best friend. That's dangerous. You don't need to date any of your patients. That's wrong. There needs to be objectivity and you break that when you start treating family members and others who are close friends of yours because then you become dangerous because you lose objectivity. But it's okay to let them become your friends. 
it's okay to develop a relationship because in so doing, you can teach them to trust God rather than trust you or themselves. Okay, here are some negatives. Professionalism is not arrogance and pride. I remember a doctor when I was a young student screaming around the hospital ward something to the effect that I can turn my niceness on or off like a faucet and I don't like what's been done here and I'm not going to be nice today. Well, I don't think it's very commendable to turn on your pleasantness one day and turn it off the next. I mean, who'd want to be married to a man like that or have a professor like that? I bet some of you have professors like that, don't you? I sure had some like that. Medicine attracts some odd types. It really does. Building trust with patients is never a reason for manipulating them or abusing them. Sexually, mentally, to build your own medical practice, to feed your ego, to get money from them or to extort them, to do extra medical tests so their insurance company will pay you more money. Oh, the list can go on. Never is trust with patients a reason to abuse them. And then confidentiality. This is straightforward. You know this. You don't talk about things outside the medical practice that are shared with you in confidence. Enough said. Okay. Let's change gears a little bit. Um, I want to just pose this to you. The key for treating illness, chronic illness effectively, is being willing to engage them on a spiritual level. Let's read that again. The key to treating chronic illness effectively is your being willing to engage patients on a spiritual level. But many of us are not willing to go there. Many of us don't feel comfortable with that. Maybe because we're not sure of our own spiritual issues. Why? I, I want you to talk to me now. This is not that I want to hear from you. Why is that first sentence possibly true? Crane up here thinks it's true. Do you think it's true? And if so, why? Why is engaging patients on a spiritual level a key to treating chronic illness effectively? Okay? You know, from the position of psychosomatic, if the person has problem inside, and this problem is everyday problem, so the, uh, the illness in the body, it will be everyday illness. So if you solve the problem inside, you will solve the problem outside. Excellent. That's why in Europe nowadays, psychosomatic is modern discipline in medicine. Very good. This is a great example. Psychosomatic illness, the scared young housewife, afraid that uh, you know, maybe she's panicking over her husband leaving her, or she feels like she's got something inside her, growing inside her, her body, and she's fearing cancer, and, or whatever. And you're, you're dealing with something that's more mind than matter. Uh, unless you can engage that spiritual, social marriage, whatever it is that's eating that, you won't treat that disease. There are other things that I want to get out of this, though. That's a very good example. Yes, ma'am. Very good. I want you to go deeper than that, but you're exactly right. Faith is what we're going for here. We're trying to help them develop the ability to have faith and use faith to interpret their illness. Um, let me go ahead and develop that while we're on it. The fact that we've got a disease that's never going to go away, let's take HIV and AIDS, for example, and you've got the stigma, whatever it is that you're dealing with about why you got it, and now these medicines that you can't afford, that are being given to you, that's the lifeline, and you've got to take them every day, and there's publicity about this in your family, and it's just, oh, there's levels of just levels of, okay, how to process this in a healthy way. How, how do we do that? Well, we've got to start asking the question, why? But the problem is we don't get answers to that question. Then it evolves to the question, how? How can this help me in my life? How can I help others with this disease? And I'm going to develop these ideas a little bit. So those kind of questions don't come out of medical textbooks. They come out of belief systems called faith. Faith in popularity, faith in money, faith in Hinduism, faith in God, faith in Jesus, faith in whatever. But a belief in M&M chocolate candies 
can change your life if you really hook